to check on the dead in case he is there. All right, we are good to go. Yeah. Good evening, viewers. Welcome to this third chapter for College Dunia Connect Season 1. As we are, we are in the midst of the lockdown due to COVID-19 outbreak, the pioneers of the education industry have come to realize the importance of going digital in the education sphere. Since all the education institutions and schools have moved on to the online classes and assignments, can we consider it as the start of the new phase of this education industry? We are certainly at the we are certainly living through a fundamental transformation in the way we work. Automation and machine learning replacing human tasks and jobs and changing the skills that organizations are looking for in their people. These momentous changes raise, however, huge organizational talent and HR challenges. At a time when the business leaders are already wrestling with unprecedented risks, disruption and climactic upheaval. Major policy changes, institutions, curriculums, courses, and various other imperative changes came into the existence during these last few years. And now, in this coming year, it is time to witness an Indian education 4.0. With me, I have a very esteemed panelist, and, I, and I'm humbled to moderate this, this discussion. Allow me to welcome each of the panelists. Dr. Pratham Sinha, the founder and chairman for Harappa Education. Dr. Sinha, is a, Dr. Sinha, as a founder and chairman for Harappa Education, which aims to become India's largest online institution focused on teaching habits and skills critical to the workplace success of 21st century. He was a founding dean of the Indian School of Business and laid the grounding of the school being ranked at FT Top 20 Global, top 20 global B schools within six years of its welcoming. He's also the founder and trustee of Ashoka University, a world-class liberal arts university. Ashoka University has built a strong reputation for academic excellence, innovative pedagogy, and transformative learning outcomes. For his many contributions, his alma mater, IIT Kharagpur, conferred the D Distinguished Alumnus Award on him in 2018. Welcome, Dr. Sinha. Professor... Professor P.V. P. V. Sharma, the Vice Chancellor for Amity University, Gurugram, a visionary educationist. Professor Sharma was the founder Vice Chancellor of the Delhi Technological University, currently the Vice Chancellor of Amity University, Gurugram, and the President of Association of Indian Universities. He's a doctorate from University of Birmingham and also a former professor from IIT Delhi. A very warm welcome, Dr. Professor Sharma. Namaskar. Professor Sandeep Sancheti, the Vice Chancellor for SRM University, is known as the institution builder. He holds a PhD from the Queen's University of Belfast, United Kingdom, after obtaining a BTEC from a regional college of engineering, Warangal, an MSc from the, from the Delhi College of Engineering in 1982 and 85, respectively. A very warm welcome, Professor Sancheti. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Shashi Anand, the Vice President of Kalashalingam University, a man with a few words. Dr. Shashi Anand believes in and lives by the precedent. Actions speak louder than words. Upon completion of his PhD in computer science from the University of Florida, Dr. Shashi returned to India and took charge of the Kalashalingam University in September 2015. After taking charge as the Vice President of the Kalashalingam University, he has several credits to his portfolio. Including, including spearheading the team to achieve the highest grade in, in, in NAC in October 2015, launching the agriculture programs in 2016, initiating the school concept of management within the university in 2017, and many more. Welcome, Dr. Shashi. And the youngest panel member of, a, of the panelist, Mr. Pratham Mittal, is currently the project director at Master School, Master's Union School of Business, a unique CXO-led business school with the CEOs and MDs of LNT, Morgan Stanley, BCG, Adani, Tata, etc. as a leading faculty. He ran new initiatives at the Lovely Group, which runs India's one of the largest universities, Lovely Professional University. 
he did his undergrad from the Wharton School and as an alumnus of the Doon School. Very warm welcome, Mr. Pratham Mittal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, panelists. So let, let us start with Dr. Pratham Sinha on the topic. Mr. Mr. Pratham Sinha, uh, it, it seems, I think there's some technical slack. Let, let, let us start with Professor Sandeep Sancheti. Professor Sandeep Sancheti, over to you, sir. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Those who are uh, participating in this webinar, welcome to them. Uh, the topic obviously is the uh, global industry needs uh, for Indian education 4.0. I'd like to throw some light on why the global industry needs Indian education. Uh, we know that we have the biggest dividend in our hand in form of the young population, and therefore, a huge number of people who are going to work across the world are going to be from India. And therefore, if Indian education system gears up itself, it can really provide quality service, support, and needs to every part of the world. So I'll not go into the industry part. The only attribute which Indians have, which will make them industry savvy wherever in the world they may be, would be something like that, that in addition to being a huge young population, we have typically multilingual. We are very good in English. That helps us uh, probably connect well. We are intelligent. We are hardworking. We are competitive. We adapt well to a situation. We obviously carry a very positive image. We are God-fearing, respectful, whatever you can say, easily satisfied, maybe to some extent contented. These are all the attributes not found easily in all the races, all the people from all countries. So Indians will always remain in demand. And it's not now. For, for centuries together, wherever Indians have gone, they have done well and they have been sought after. So now why education will drive this particular theme is something very important. And I'll connect it with the education 4.0. It's something called a terminology like what we have the uh, GPS or the mobile 2.0 or whatever you can say. So 4.0 is a terminology, but we know that what is education 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, even 3.0 or education 3.0 was technologically driven, but it was not necessarily student centric. Now it's going to be a student centricity, which is coming into play. And the student centricity means people will be able to design their degrees. People will be able to decide their courses. People will be able to decide what they want to study, when they want to study, how they want to study, which medium they want to study, or whether they'll convert their credits into degrees, diplomas, or something like that. And therefore, the Education 4.0 is going to make a hell of a lot of change in what Indian young population is going to learn and deliver to the world. And therefore, I have few small slides, two or three slides, if the if the slides can be presented, I'll be very happy that how the scene is changing. Number one, the disruptions which are going to happen in the educational domain. I've just given some examples. You may have a whole long list and you may change the list also. For example, for me, under the education 4.0, specializations will become fudgy in the sense they will not be something what you call electrical or electronics or computer or mechanical. You can make them fuzzy. Knowledge becomes less proprietary. It will not remain with some sect or some people or some country or some zone or some institutions. Teachers themselves will become learners, which probably teachers will have to now accept very easily. Uh, earlier, probably it was teaching centric. Now it has to be learning centric. My own take will be 30, 70 in terms of teaching and 70 in terms of learning. Probably this percentage will go again uh, slightly more asymmetric in times to come. There will be no age bar for formal education, which is currently a lot of institutions say that we don't take beyond 2025. Degrees will become meaningless. I think industry is driving that. Today we know in information security that a lot of people and a lot of other things in terms of design and other things, people don't need to have degrees. And the boundaries of HEIs will be punctured. These are some of the examples of educational disruptions. Let's see the next slide. The next slide will give you more information on the educational transformations which will need to survive 
for example, a student should be able to pick teacher and pick timings and therefore flexibility and the quality will both come in the hand of the student. Will a student will design his or her own syllabus and therefore it will be based on the needs and interests. A student can design their degrees also. That means it will be a student centricity which will come. And then finally, the two things on examinations take open book examinations, which is a real world situation anytime. And that should happen. And many of us are trying to do it. And then a final thing in terms of examination will be the appear in examination on demand. And that is how uh, whenever I'm ready, like whenever I'm ready, I eat. Likewise, whenever I'm ready, I'll go to examination also. So these are some of the examples of educational transformation. Now, how is this going to happen is just the one last slide, which I'll share with you. And I believe uh, that is an initiative by the UGC. And I believe that that initiative will make education 4.0 reality. Can you please uh, put the next slide? The whole thing is called as the National Academic Credit Bank. And I'm showing some sample here, which are going to be the building blocks of that particular, uh, you can say, NACB scheme. As you can see, it is in the center. It is driven by uh, UGC, not by any individual like us. But I am a part of that. The first thing I'll see is that it will be having or allowing any subject or any branch combination. And therefore, it will break the notion of specific branches or specific subjects, something like that. Similarly, Bachelor of Education or Bachelor of Becom, uh, Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Engineering, etc., can also be converted. So it will break the uh, notion of degree nomenclature or degree specialization. And in case I make a potpourri of all what I read, I'll probably call the degree as Bachelor of Liberal Education, like we have liberal arts, we can have liberal education. So I can take courses across science, commerce, engineering, medical, and then make my degree. I can convert my credits into degrees and diplomas over a period of time. So the currency would be slightly different, and I can convert it at any time in 10 years, five years, whatever it may be. I can study in any national or international institutions, and I can do it from any location or any campus or any number of times or something like that. So once again, the, 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 the hierarchy of the campuses and for, uh, formal registration will be broken. Lifelong learning enabling will happen because we can study up to 60, 70, 75, whatever you want to do in this particular case. So once again, you'll find out that the notion of time will go away. And there will be a time when we can uh, we are proposing that degrees can be going faster instead of a four year degree. It will become 75 percent of the time. It will go in three years or a three year degree can a two year degree can possibly happen in one and a half years. So once again, that will change. And then, of course, we'll merge all regular distance online, virtual, whatever you can call. I will rather call it as a flexible education and uh, it will also have the skill education. So there are various, various things which will come under education 4.0, which will make Indian students very vibrant and which will make sure that we are sought after. We are industry relevant. I'm not talking about various other features like how do we use the IT? How do we use the artificial intelligence? How do we use big data and supporting all that? I'm just talking of some basic building blocks which will make. And this is going to be part of the ACUBE. This is going to be the part of the uh, new education policy as and when it gets finally driven by the ministry and by the UGC and the AICT and other agencies. So hopefully Indian Education 4.0 would be a reality in time to come. Very, very valid points, Professor Sanchedi. Very valid points. We'll come back to you these points for sure. Please, uh, to the viewers, keep putting in your questions. The polls will be live very soon. Over to you, Dr. Shashi. What what are your thoughts on this topic? Dr. Shashi, what, what, what are your thoughts on this topic? There seems to be a technical snag here. Uh, Mr. Pratham Mittal, let's move on to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Can we have sure, so, uh, thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think he's back uh, if Shashi wants to take the question. Not yet. Still. Not yet. I think let's. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Shashi will come back. Sure. To you. Sure. So uh, I think I want to talk about innovations in two respects. One is in online education, and one is in offline education. So let's talk about online education first. Uh, you know, first of all, I have to really appreciate the the homegrown innovations that are coming out of India, and Harappa is a great example of it. And I've used the platform myself, and I know the kind of work that is being done is is you know world class, truly. 
and it's really helping the students as well as the teachers um so you know uh, you know in india we have a lot of interesting innovation happening in the online space but it's still not mainstream yet uh, you know india as a market is not mature enough to accept uh, non degree courses as yet so for online education to really become mainstream and roll uh, you know millions of students rather than hundreds of thousands of students um, you know we need to have online degrees that are accredited by uh, the various agencies uh and finally now i think last year was the first time when the ugc aicit etc um everyone sort of gotten together to make online degrees a reality and i believe almost uh, seven universities uh have now been approved to start online programs uh and give and grant online degrees um and and you know in order to ensure the quality of the same the, the you know ugc has put in and even the mhrd has put in some very stringent measures um so the university has to be in you know uh, nrf top 100 and uh, they have to have a very high nac score uh, and only then can they get into online education so i think with this coming in online education will finally become mainstream in india the way it is in the us uh, where you know millions of students are enrolling in online degrees so that's that's the part about online education uh, now i want to talk about offline and the innovations in offline uh, education uh, you know uh, already we have more seats than there are takers uh, for higher education in india right so, so access is not a problem supply Uh, is not a problem however uh, i'll just throw a few numbers around uh, in total there are 37 million indians who are enrolled in an institute of higher education that's almost 4 crores so let's round it up to 4 crores in terms of number of phd's in the country right uh, we are almost at around 300000 that's about it yeah right uh, so that entails a ratio of 1 is to 100 so we have for every 100 students we have one phd uh, you know the various agencies require a uh, Uh, a ratio of one is to twenty, one is to fifteen in that area, right? Uh, so obviously we are not going to be able to, uh, uh, you know, cater to the kind of uh, volume of students that we have in the country. Uh, so we need some innovations there. So of course, online education will come in and and take up, um, you know, some of this uh, demand. And I heard um, uh, Dr. Sanjeevi also saying that, uh, you know, uh, in his college, I think almost twenty percent of all courses, irrespective of Corona. will be online right um and even at lpu i know for a fact that almost 25% courses are already online um but i think one interesting thing that will happen is that uh, a lot of the professor uh, uh, you know a lot of the professor requirement would be filled in by practitioners right uh, the need for professors to be supplemented by industry practitioners so we actually uh, i think in the near future we'll see a lot of practitioners from the industry cxos corporates etc coming back to the classroom and teaching um you know when i was in college at uh, at wharton we had a lot of our professors who were practitioners um and you know you know they were teaching with the amperedits kind of a model and you know in india we already see very good results uh, of this across the world in fact in medical education so medical college is always situated inside a medical hospital and the teachers are all uh, doctors who themselves operate on uh, patients they are not uh, academics alone so and that leads to great outcomes uh, you know indian doctors are amongst uh, the best in the world and the outcomes the career outcomes for uh, indian educated doctors are are at par with uh, with with any doctor in the world so uh, i think uh, once we see practitioners coming down into the classroom and supplementing the academic professors we'll see a huge shift um, in the way the offline education is perceived conceived uh and how the outcomes will improve will also be something that will become very apparent with uh practitioners coming in so two things just to summarize one is that uh, you know online degrees will make online education uh, mainstream in india uh, and offline education uh, you know the shortage in quality professors will be compensated and supplemented by industry practitioners coming in uh, and actually teaching so those are the two points i want to leave the audience with today thank you thank you mr mithu thanks a lot uh dr sinha uh is uh, are, are you with us there seems to be some technical snag of uh, i think there seems to be some technical snag we are not able to reach him professor pv sharma over to you sir please give your take on the topic such a such a great pleasure and privilege to be part of this great panel on industry 4.0 education 
let me at the outset go back to the first slide if you can. Um, let me speak for a few seconds. Uh, yes, there it is. Uh, first of all, let me pray to God Almighty that all the viewers who are connected to this webinar uh, remain happy and healthy during the testing times of coronavirus and let the divine powers uh, save our country from the kind of disaster which otherwise could have happened. Having said this, let me also say that uh, I'm so excited to be part of this panel. And uh, Dr. Sancheti as well as Mr. Pratham Mittal have already laid the groundwork for us to now envision what kind of Indian education 4.0 we require to serve the needs of industry in India as well as abroad. In fact, uh, we are more fortunate than many learning in India it is said begins with life often people say abroad that learning ends with life but here in our country we believe that learning continues beyond life because who knows i'll be born again and i'll carry forward the sum total of wisdom which i continue and therefore the emphasis on learning especially self-learning is very high in our our system uh, therefore i thought in the next few uh, slides let me take you through very quickly what engineering education does i call it infinity education because infinite opportunities of doing things in a better way for the goodness of mankind are open through engineering education it drives growth and development of nation's economy cannot be denied it runs the wheels of power creates the necessary dynamism in the society thrill and excitement it's created on the strength of engineering it drives mobility and it also creates comfort engineering of the kind which we are so well accustomed to now but it also provides wings of fire creates synergy creates energy and thrust to take flights of success uh, next one go to the next slide the new the key elements which drive industry of course we need to also realize that uh, the uh, new materials uh, are in fact the key for advancement in material science hold the key for driving the new materials and new industries uh, and we have seen tremendous amount of advancement in this respect taking place in this direction uh, with new and smart materials intelligent materials ion exchange materials nano structured materials all that is happening and we find that new design techniques have also emerged and we have to keep them in focus while responding to education 4.0 design and manufacturing go together today it's not just design and therefore we need to understand the integrated system of design and manufacturing mounted on the life cycle assessment of design and its overall impact on the production line production line has also become very very strong and very flexible and smart and we have multifunctionality and life cycle built into ever reducing product cycle but the key element which are driving industry 4.0 today are basically robotics and automation ever increasing role of robotics is coming in people like me are really worried today how would my people find employment in terms of their engagement in a industry 4.0 today maybe 5.0 tomorrow we have to really learn how to work with robotics as co-workers and, and increasingly abreast automation at all levels, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain technologies, IOTs and ever rising applications, cyber and info security, integrated supply chain management, continuous product innovation, creating new market are in fact the key uh, takes from the industry and the new Technologies which are driving industry, of course, are already there are surveys to indicate that uh, the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to come in in a big way. So will be the role of new technologies, including uh, 3D printing and adaptive manufacturing and new services. Engineering tomorrow, therefore, education included must address to these new challenges and must accordingly frame its uh, curriculum to, to respond to these challenges. Uh, the science tomorrow also likewise like engineering is also changing and we have a big role for data science coming in now earlier they used to say data kuch nahi data but today everybody is saying data sab kuch data and therefore the focus on data science and big data analytics machine learning integrative science earlier all sciences were in different compartments but now we are learning now that chemistry physics mathematics and biology 
as well as any new sciences like nano science and technology and microbial sciences all must learn how to integrate themselves in order to deliver the promise which is required and in this respect the interdisciplinary nature of science has emerged as a very important aspect of our education today like why the interdisciplinary engineering also um, the science <clears throat> education is also therefore th throwing in a big challenge increased focus on integrating education with research has become now a reality hence one experience of learning by doing is very much essential for the newer disciplines like robotics artificial intelligence and machine learning and we have to promote research and innovation as an integral aspect of education 4.0 in order to create future ready professionals from our university and i'm very happy that in amity university we are submitting to this cause from curriculum design to curriculum delivery to hands on experience engaging students into new innovations including a state of art and going beyond the limits of knowledge which are there at the moment employers as has been rightly said by dr sanchetti as well as mr pratham they are not looking at your degree they are looking at the capabilities which you have and these capabilities can come only by product innovation and engaging students increasingly in minor projects and innovations and new product development in our university system very very well professor sharma very well said we'll be come, we'll coming back to you on this topic again we'll be coming back to you uh, just conclude this last slide yeah. that education 4.0 in fact should be uh, christened as education 5.0 in order to address the needs of the industry of today as well as tomorrow the courses such as artificial intelligence machine learning etc must be integrated in all disciplines of engineering and by doing this we will be able to make engineering in fact in true sense a, a game changer for the industry of tomorrow with these words i thought let me Uh, let me finish my presentation i'll come back to it the culture of innovation incubation startup has to be now an essential integral part of the design of the university of today as well as the colleges and institutions of tomorrow thank you thank you professor sharma we'll be coming back to you specifically on the designing designing of the courses specifically i think we have dr sinha with us dr sinha can you hear me okay now very well sir very well sir sir can we have a valuable thoughts on the topic please yes uh sorry about the glitches in the beginning uh listen i think everything that has to be said has been said and uh, i don't want to repeat the topics the repeat the points that were made by the earlier speakers but i uh would like to put uh, three ideas forward which is how i like to think about what's happening uh, with uh, technology in today's time Uh, the first is that uh, for us in india while uh, i agree with pratham that there are enough seats and um, maybe not enough demand the truth is if you look at quality demand or if you look at quality supply quality education that's the big thing that's missing uh, and so i think in india we have to look at technology and education 4.0 as uh, actually providing education to the uneducated or people who are not getting quality education because while all of this online education and online learning started from the west people there are really educating the educated it's a luxury to sort of get more education online and cheaper education online for us in india it's not about getting cheaper education online it's making sure that everybody gets an education and a quality education because never before in the history of mankind has we had to educate so many people at the same time and these people now all want quality education they are not happy with just some education so that's my first point which is at a national point i think the second point i want to make which is the institutional point is that for all of us as educational administrators we have to look at this as a discontinuity which is a bit like the discontinuity that must have happened when the book the printed book arrived So you see, before that, education was all about sitting in front of a guru in a small group, watching the person talk, uh, hearing their knowledge, their experiences, and learning from that. And essentially, it was small groups, small numbers. Not everybody got the benefit of that. When books arrived, everybody said, "How are we going to learn from books? And how will we ever learn from books?" You are saying that I will not have a teacher in the classroom, and I will actually just learn by reading a book. 
and then look what happened uh, you know uh, book has become books have become part of our life and i think similarly online education and online learning will become part of our lives will that ever replace the teacher in the classroom obviously not but what that does do is that it allows you to reach out to many more people and still have the model of the teacher being in there in the classroom and teaching so i think that's how we have to look at it as a whole new discontinuity that is happening for teachers i see a very interesting analogy i i also i'm also a person who worked in the media industry you know when in the early days uh, uh, and tell you you must be a media guy also in the early days what used to happen is you know if you're a journalist you write 10 articles and the if your editorial page editor picks one of your articles it gets published and you're very happy that you reached yeah. a few people and so the fight used to be ki mera article publish ho jaye आज के दिन में पीपल डोंट केयर अबाउट आर्टिकल्स दे केयर अबाउट हाउ मेनी टाइम्स दे आर ट्वीटिंग ऑन देयर ट्विटर अकाउंट एंड हाउ मेनी फॉलोअर्स दे हैव दे डोंट नीड द एडिटोरियल पेज एनी लॉन्गर दे डोंट नीड दे सो दे स्टिल राइट द एडिटोरियल पेज द अपडेट फॉर द एडिटोरियल पेज बट दे आर आल्सो डूइंग सोशल मीडिया दे आर रीचिंग आउट टू पीपल थ्रू यू नो इमीडिएट न्यूज़ रिएक्शंस दे आर एक्चुअली डायरेक्टली इन टच विद द रीडर आई थिंक दैट्स व्हाट्स हैपनिंग गोइंग टू हैपन टू टीचिंग एज अ प्रोफेशन all teachers are actually going to have two parallel professions one in the classroom physically and one online and that's what happened to journalism and that's what happened to media people the last thing i will say and i'll stop after that is if you look at what's happening to students if you take the analogy of the classroom or or what actually happens on campus students now have an infinite number of electives so the 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 full time program where you are getting your bachelor's degree or your master's degree is still there but you can now learn beyond that so think of your you know till then till now you had a few electives that the university offered when you were part of their campus now your electives can be from anywhere in the world uh, and so it's really infinite you can pick up a course from anywhere in the world it is not essentially about adding to your degree or not it's fine if it doesn't add to your degree and finally uh these electives can be taken at any time in your life uh you can take it while you are doing your degree formal degree it can be after your degree it can be when you are 30 years old 40 years old 50 years old so that's how i see this for the nation uh, a massive opportunity to educate the uneducated in a quality way for the institution uh being able to think about this as another kind of disruption that happened when the book came for the faculty member of parallel career track and alternative career uh, and for the students infinite electives for, for life. life thank you thank you dr sina i'll pick, pick the cue from uh, from what what you said so do you really think that the faculty or the teaching uh, in the pedagogy of 4.0 are the faculty or the are the acad- academicians specifically they are ready to adopt the indian education uh, 4.0 are they really ready as of now hello dr sinha hear me uh, i can yeah. hear you can you hear yes, me yes 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 i'm still on the audio line can you still hear me yeah Yeah, my yeah. point is that yes uh, i think i think people have re- um, re- adapted remarkably fast uh, mm-hmm. i do think that uh, this that has been one of the uh, side benefits of if i can say the silver lining of this whole episode <laughs> that uh, people have been forced to adopt but i have been amazed to see how quickly people have adopted when I mean, people did still don't know we are still struggling how to use zoom and these platforms just as i was struggling to get on three or platform but that apart once or twice they get into the mode of teaching this way i think they are fine i always tell faculty that you know what uh, you can forget about all the paraphernalia the one big switch you have to make uh, and that i think is a fundamental point from my own experience teaching online the fundamental switch you have to make is don't think of talking to a class think of talking to one person very well said if you were in a if you are in a tuition i mean tuition is always looked down on but i don't know if you know i used to go in my my days to a english teacher in, when i was growing up in patna it was a one on one class right if if faculty teaches one on one 
uh, which they are used to doing. Uh, they, they are used to actually having meetings with students, explaining concepts to them, clearing their doubts, helping them with their assignments. If they actually use this medium in that way, that really becomes the trick of converting from a classroom to this medium. Because right now I'm talking as if I'm talking to you directly. I know there are many, many people listening. I can't see them, but they are able to follow me and engage with me better because they hear me speaking to them directly rather than the thousand people who may be on this call. And so it, it's tough to get into that mindset, but once you adopt that mindset, ki kisi ek, ek ko padana, ek student ko padana. And if I can teach one student directly through this medium well, then I can teach all thousand. And I think faculty will be able to do that. Faculty are smart, they will figure it out. Professor Sanchiti, what are your thoughts here? Uh, is the faculty or the academicians actually ready to adopt? Oh. I would say very much ready because, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Education 3.0 was nothing but technology driven. It may be now technology led in a certain way. Technology driven means we started using internet, we used virtual and smart classrooms and everything. Only thing is, it was still a fixed pipeline where what we wanted to teach, we taught and students didn't have the choice of learning what they wanted to learn so the only difference is that we are giving them the flexibility so fortunately technology is enabling all that and this current situation of covid has made sure that uh, it happens very fast i must tell you that we are one of the biggest in terms of student size yeah. we are currently around 50000 students 50000 plus and uh, we have hardly had anything against this particular model students are happy teachers are happy i'm just giving you a data of one platform google classroom we have already done 20,000 plus sessions in last two weeks on Google Classroom itself. Imagine that we have Microsoft Team. Imagine we have TCS Classroom. Imagine we have Canvas. Zoom, of course, has become very common and very popular. Skype is uh, always there. Various other things which are there. So people are getting hooked. The challenge really happens to be the challenge from the non-science and non-engineering students who are not so necessarily technologically savvy or maybe they are coming from more from rural background or here and there so their connectivity may be poor but i think uh, there is a willingness from the student side and once that is there i think teacher gets excited easily doing something teacher today is not delivering the material or content teacher is a facilitator enabler a counselor Everything which a teacher can do, as I said, it is becoming 30% teaching only. So as Sinasa was also saying, teacher can focus itself in doing what they want to do in terms of flipped classroom model. You can always put your notes, always put the references, always discuss the case studies. And therefore, teaching has also taken different shape, which is exciting the teachers. Let me tell you, every one of us have taken the technology in every sense of our lives functioning as a positive thing, a microwave, a fridge, uh, a vehicle, always have added some positive value to us. And same way that the, the work from home or the use of technology will possibly do the same thing. Today, I will easily say that this is now going to be a permanent feature and it's now going to figure in all the teaching learning activities of times to come. Please understand there are a couple of things which we talked about the education. We said that the access and equity has happened. GER is increasing, but the access will increase by this feature only. Equity will also increase because the same teacher will be able to teach to 500,000, 10,000 people if they so like. We will have the transparency because each one of us will know what am I doing to others. So these features are there. But imagine the features of speed. Imagine the feature of efficiency. Imagine the feature of diversity, which one can have using technology are unimaginable. You cannot be in a 60 square meter of classroom and doing all the wonders you are expected to do in 4.0. This is what technology is doing. So everyone is excited, in my opinion. Very, Thank well, you. very, very well put, Professor Sanjiti. I think uh, Dr. Shashi is in line with us. Dr. Shashi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. So, what are your thoughts? Uh, are, are we, are the edu academicians and the faculty, the, really ready for uh, Indian Education 4.0? What are your thoughts? Uh, 
first of all so apologies for the technical glitches so i think like you know as as, as my previous speakers have already mentioned education 4.0 itself involves a lot of change as universities the whole definition of how we deliver education the whole concept of universities everything should be changing in the future for the better is what we are we have to mainly focus on couple of points which i really wanted to like you know touch upon when we talk about education 4.0 first and foremost what i think is like you know in terms of how the delivery of education so uh, currently like you know it is more of a lecture driven model and then like you know as it's, it's already been mentioned it's more teacher centric we need to make it more learner centric and most importantly get the learners outside of the classroom as much as possible which means basically get their hands dirty so yes knowledge is available a plenty like you know nowadays with the advent of information like you know multiple websites are there for students to gain information when they want the ease of finding information is easy but the the, the practicality of applying it making it practical is what is a challenge and that is where universities and colleges and educational institutions play a major role because first and foremost we need to like you know the industry is not forgiving at all whereas academia and universities generally are very forgiving towards students we are playground for students to try fail and learn so this is what we need to facilitate for the students so that they can try as much as possible do as much practical things as possible fail learn and in turn hone their hone their skills so first of all that is what i believe as universities and educational institutions there should be a playground for students to enhance their practical skills give them opportunities in multiple ways so that those are honed second thing is in terms of assessment like evaluation rather than having a very traditional return examination type as has already been said students can like you know write exam when they want open book examination multiple ways are there but what it is we have to look at what students have understood and what they are able to apply is what like you know i am coming to back to the same point is how assessments would also be changing in education 4.0 and uh, finally one opportunity for uh, education institutions in education 4.0 i feel is now is the age of uh, lifelong learning we are seeing corporates like you know fire people because they are unable to up, up skill themselves as educational institutions if we provide an avenue not only for our own students but also for our alumni and other people and to up skill like you know this could be in the form of video lectures or mass, like you know through mooc this is another another opportunity wherein in which we are contributing towards the up skill of the society as well Doctor, I see two things out of your out of uh, what you say regarding ups upskilling, uh, and the research bit. So, how online education is uh, comfortable with respect to research work when it comes into picture? How online online education can actually enhance the research work? Because at the end, the design courses will have to have the dis- the research bit and more integrated, in specifically in sciences. So what is your take as in how can online education rather help or enhance the research work definitely so research is something like you know nowadays it is not like you know in the old days wherein you need to be physically present in one location wherein like you know you have all the facilities available and then like you know that way you do you carry out research and then with that data you know you continue on there are um, the technology has evolved so much name an instrument like you know which was there in engineering you now have a simulation for the same available technology has evolved to that extent so technology plays a major role in the research acumen and then like you know and how research people carry out their research as well so rather than of the focus in which the faculty member should be doing right now is not focusing on simple technologies but rather like you know how students carry out work how can students get things done so it should be more on the process rather than the object itself so when the focus is on that then definitely students would be able to play around inculcate try out new, new things and then like you know carry on with their own life too thanks hmm. mr mr mithil with is is with us mr mithil can you hear me yeah yeah i'm here yeah. yes yes i can yeah i am come i'll come i am coming back to your point that practitioners becoming the acad- academicians uh hmm. how important is it for for this aspect to be true to make the academicians ready for uh, education 
as per you right i mean uh, sure sure so i think uh, you know i gave the example of the medical college so i'll just like to extend that a little bit more you know yeah. uh, in india if you look at the placement statistics of various departments you'll see that some of the best placements some of the best outcomes for students happen in the discipline of medicine right and pharmaceutical sciences etc better than data sciences better than mba better than digital marketing uh, better than computer science etc right and and the reason for that is that the person who's teaching the classroom is actually someone who is operating on the patients every day right he's someone who knows what the industry is all about right and so when he comes into the classroom the way he's able to train students is very different from someone who perhaps has not been practicing himself right so i think that with the practitioners coming in uh, the kind of education that students will get will be more hands on right uh, in fact i feel like they can make every class uh, sort of feel like an internship almost uh, right it's as if the student is actually going to the workplace and learning that uh, the only difference is that of logistics but actually the student is not going to the office but the office is coming to the student right uh, that's point 1 point 2 i also want to respond to some of the other uh, issues that were made um uh, you know around online learning and and whether uh, online learning will um you know necessarily uh, take the place of our universities and i i feel that there's a certain um uh, there's a certain nature there's a certain uh, aspect of co-location uh, within universities and within colleges uh, that makes our experience very wholesome right uh, so for example if i take my own uh, instance I met my business partner uh, in my university. I, in fact, uh, you know, met most of my friends in a college campus. I did my first group project uh, in a college campus. I learned teamwork. Uh, I played all my sports. Uh, I, you know, performed on the stage uh, in a theater group. I did all of these things in a co-located environment. So, and and this is where the true learning happens. If I ask, if I ask the audience, you know, uh, wh- what do you think were the most uh important memories that you have from your college life very few of them will actually uh, give the example of a classroom they'll always talk about things outside of the classroom right and the learnings outside of the classroom so i think that online learning will really supplement the classroom but not the university right so uh, the aspect of co-location and and people meeting and collaborating with each other and uh, you know living in this wholesome ecosystem that will never go uh the classes will become online uh, you have better content more optimized content uh, but that will not take away from the traditional co-located campuses okay thanks mr mithil uh, to to our viewers the polls are live we would want if each and every one to uh, please go on the poll section and please poll on the question meanwhile just pouring keep pouring in your questions um professor sharma my question my question to you specifically what is the regulatory framework which will be needed specifically when the online universities are coming up and the government is already allowing universities to give give away online degrees what is the regulatory framework is required as per you really speaking if you ask me i am not bothered about regulatory system i am more concerned about the mindset with which the education 4.0 is to be delivered when i was in delhi college of engineering i said to my teachers the teachers must learn from students students must learn from teachers all the teachers came to me they said why should we learn from the students in in, the, in education 4.0 today it's very important that teachers and students learn together and they learn together in the company of their collaborators from the industry and also from the research and development organization it is this vital change mindset and uh, change in mindset in my opinion is absolutely essential let us take it for Uh, this seriously that industry, education 4.0 is research and innovation driven and that is why a good point has been made by the previous panelists that learning outside the classroom in a collaborative manner would be far more important actually than learning just inside the classroom where teacher is seen as a sage on stage that time has gone as far as one to one teaching is concerned i don't mind doing it but really speaking in a country like ours where you have a population of 130 crore people and 666 of them below 25 years of age it would be very important for us to understand the context of education 4.0 today to address to the new challenges as far as regulatory system is concerned i'm sure the government of the day is understanding the value and worth of 
online education, its integration in our formal system is already taking place through regulation. And in the days to come, the fear that online education is inferior compared to the formal education, that fear will also disappear. If I am in a position to improve the quality of my deliveries in the online system by throwing visuals and throwing video clips and also telling stories and sharing with them a whole lot of experience and not just the knowledge which already exists on the net, then I think the quality of online education will create wonders and we are sitting on a good line of opportunity in this respect. I'm very happy that teachers in my university are well prepared and they have taken this challenge head on while delivering the online classes as well as conducting review meetings and taking even mentoring meetings with the student. And we as administrators have been also conducting Zoom meetings with our teachers as well as with the HOIs to understand and how to really support them in this direction. So the days ahead are certainly very bright and I really see the regulators coming forward with a bigger head and, and mind. Let them understand that that time of one to one has gone. Today you are in, in a position where you can offer high quality online education for millions of people, not only just in India, even abroad. And this would put India in a great advantage. And India must address this challenge, in my opinion, and respond to it in the right aspect. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, thanks, Professor. Uh, Doctor Sinha, you have been really thinking ahead of your uh, ahead of your time. What do you think that the universities are still not allowed to give impart even a distance learning until unless it's UGC approved? So, what? How do you think that the regulators are going to accept this? And what regulatory framework would you look at in the times to come, specifically to online universities and online no, uh, I think delivery the of the system? Universities, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if I've thought about this enough, uh, you know, what is the regulatory framework? I think in, the, in an ideal scenario, a university is a university. It, it, it's, it's called a university because it has a certain right to decide what it teaches and how it teaches. So, you know, if Professor Sharma or if Professor Sanchez here uh, have the option to, should have the freedom to decide what courses they will offer in their university for credit, whether it's their own courses, whether it's classroom courses, whether it's online, whether they want to borrow a course from outside. I think that's what universities are. And, and you have to trust the universities and the faculty and their governance model to take that decision. I think there's, a, there's some suspicion in the regulator still because this is new. And that's why I was talking about the book analogy. Yeah. Uh, that somehow by online education, quality will go down. Okay. Uh, so we will not allow that we will hold back. Uh, and then how can anybody get a degree or right? Uh, but I think people are going to learn and realize that. So now, you know, in a very, if I, if you ask me, there's not been major reform in this country for many, many years in education, but the fact that 20% of courses can be online courses is actually, I am told, allowed for all universities. Or the fact that now, right. India may regulation is always a, a bit of a, you know, it's a dial. So, first they take it to 10. So, they say, okay, top 100 NRF ranked can do online degrees, okay? Yeah. Then that 100 will become 500. Then it will become, okay, everybody can do it, right? So, I think the dial has started to move. Uh, this, you know, if you think about telecom reform, you remember, I don't know how old you are, Taranjot, but, you know, they said, okay, major metros go A, B, C circles go karke, we will order cellular phone service because this cellular phone service cannot be offered to everybody. It is very expensive, only some people, so only metros can. Now today, cellular phone has become the biggest democratization thing for the most poorest of Indians. So I think Sapkush starts with a little bit of a, you know, let's start small and then it will happen. So I see that the walls have already started to break down and uh, they will, I think, break down further when people like us bring high quality courses, right? So, for example, I've started recently an initiative called Harappa uh, Education, where I teach purely online. My attempt is to say, I am going to build an institution that is online to begin with. 
Yeah. I was involved in setting up ISB, which started from uh, uh, is a brick and mortar. Ashoka is a brick and mortar. I'm saying, can you build a university or an institution? Forget university. Don't call it a university. Can you build an institution that is pure online, which is my courses I'm offering only online. So I think those things will happen, and regulator will look at the quality of those and say, "Huh, this is fine. Let's 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 accredit them. Let's recognize them. Let's approve them." So we have to push the bar. And uh, one key step, I think, will be will be to design and develop this course content actually that allows itself uh, to be delivered across multiple multiple delivery mediums. I think uh, Dr. Sina, you will be the uh, probably the uh, the best person to actually tell uh, to ponder upon this point and highlight that how important is uh, designing this this content which can be delivered via uh, uh, via different delivery. Very, very important. Very important. Very yeah. important. So again, if you took a, think of the book analogy, yeah. you know, previously a teacher can go to a class and just talk, right? A guru can sit under a tree and talk about experiences life now if you put all of this into a 200 page book then you have to really think about how the book will be organized which chapter which you know at the end of the book what questions you'll ask how will you make people learn what assignments will you give so similarly here just as you are doing this online you know now you have a interactive poll going on while we are talking yeah you are suddenly popping up these polls which we are answering there's a constant stream of questions now, as teachers, we are not used to constant stream of questions. We say, listen, let me first finish the lecture, and then we will take questions. Now, if I keep the chat thing on, I'm constantly seeing what is going on. In a lot of our online courses, courses that we do, there's a TA who's sitting there, and he's monitoring all the, the questions coming on the chat so that yeah. everybody's questions can be answered, not just the people who raise their hands and try to get it. So a lot of new things are possible. Many things are not possible, okay, which we will never be able to do online, which we are able to do offline. But there are many things that are possible. For example, people actually don't want to see you. Our big learning at Harappa is that if you look most look at most online learning MOOCs, it's really a replication of what happens in the class. So a teacher stands in front of a camera and he talks and he uses slides and so on. But we have found through, our, through hard evidence that nobody wants to watch somebody talking for more than two minutes, 120 seconds. Mm. Ke baad, they don't want to see that face. So we are, our courses need to have only two minute videos and then after that you have to do something else. Now, how do you do that in a way that is not gimmicky? How do you do that in a way that still ensures learning, right? Yet, so if one of the things we do is that for each course, we have now multiple faculty. So constantly one faculty comes in, does two minutes, then you show some slides, then you do some exercises, then you do some assessment, then the next faculty comes in, he or she does two minutes. And as Pratham was saying, some faculty are academic, some faculty are practitioners. So you give the variety in a particular course, which you don't have to do in a classroom. Usually there's one person who's talking throughout the time. Yeah. So those are the innovations that will happen in the way the courses are designed. And I think that is really the opportunity and that is really the exciting part about it. Mm, right. Thanks, Dr. Sinha. Professor Sanjayati, could you highlight this specifically in the light of uh, the National Academic Credit Bank, uh, that NAC model that you had created? Could you specifically throw some light specifically to designing the courses and having a omni-channel way of delivering them? See, uh, many times we hear about courses, a lot of people talk about there should be a uniformity, there should be a guideline from so and so. The moment you try to do that, you will kill the ingenuity, you will kill the newness or innovativeness. I think uh, this should be left to the faculty in a certain way, to the institutions of higher learning in a certain way then only there is a diversity. Now, many of us are sitting in this uh, discussion here. Each one of can teach the same course in a slightly different way. Now, if my student is able to choose which way will suit him best, someone would like to learn a subject by just by skilling and he's happy because he would like a job and a work of that nature. Another wouldn't purely would be a researcher on that. So he would like to know in a certain way. 
the third one possibly could be using it for manufacturing and running an industry in the same subject so he'll learn it in a slightly different way so i would say that any particular medicine or unique approach which you follow is a is a right approach no that is killing the the whole thing so when it comes to uh, nacb approach national academic credit bank everything which you can imagine on earth will change as far as the education is concerned and i'm forewarning and i've done it a couple of times to my fellow friends that if we don't mend our ways the universities may also cease to exist maybe the challenge we may have i just give you an example to explain how it is student centric whether it is a course or class a timing or a teacher to be decided or exam to be decided right now what happens is you get into a course called let's say btech today and after 4 years you will graduate now if you do not graduate all those 4 years or 3 years are lost nothing happens your course don't get counted so there is a pipeline in which you enter and after 4 years when you exit something happens called btech degree but in this model the whole pipeline will be a punctured pipeline it will be a leaky pipeline i can make an exit anywhere i can make an entrance anywhere while i'm doing my first year of engineering i don't like my engineering because i was forced i will go to bba and suddenly after a, another year i realize no no i was meant for economics and therefore i go it is very likely in this scheme that i will save almost 3 2/3 to 3/4 of my courses which i have done in last two years while doing engineering and bba yeah. still will be counted for my other degree and therefore everything whether it is a course whether it is an examination or a teacher or a classroom or nature of degree suppose i have ultimately found interest changing one after another and it becomes a complex that i have not fulfilled the requirement of a degree for bcom or bba or bsc i may still get a liberal education degree and therefore everything would be something which is going to be student centric teachers will have to be on their toes and one thing on the distance education you were asking i was also member of dac when it was dissolved after my 3 years term it was almost the end of that i must say that formal education contact education is only with us for 5 years the rest of the 45 years of anyone's life is a distance education online education lifelong learning or learning by themselves and therefore this is going to be the main feature we are uh, doing it irrespective of a degree or a diploma examination pass or fail lot of questions are being raised on moocs why the completion rate is so less i must tell you that i have done a mooc course today i am not interested in the examination but just because i wanted to learn i have learned something i need not have the degree or diploma out of that and therefore the the change will be of the highest order and one last thing on the industry part would be that the industry part would become very open employing people from industry to teach would be something very good which was said by mr pratham mittal yeah. similarly the the internships would be a challenge in times to come because the numbers are increasing and its uh, industry have certain kind of a challenge and now indian is, industry is also getting into research so universities and industry put together will drive the research education will happen in much more flexible mode thanks professor santhi mr mittal we have talking mm-hmm. we have we've been talking yeah. about the delivery of via online medium what about the what about yeah. the assessment how are the assessment models going to change i mean we, the polls results are coming in so so 43% of the uh, respondents they believe the highly expected skill from education 4.0 graduates it's the entrepreneurial mindset keeping that into the yeah. keeping that into the mind how do you think the online assessments or the evaluation mechanisms are going to change sure uh, so here uh, you know let's look at neet let's look at many other government exams the mass government exams um, they are already happening online right so there is a framework whereby uh, hundreds and thousands of people are taking online tests and assessments already so that system we already have in place now let's say you want to go one step ahead and allow people to take exams sitting at home so that they don't even have to go to an online center at a pearson center or a um, you know tcs ion center so in that case now i feel like we have reached a stage where there are technologies that are available that make sure if you're taking a test online on your computer screen then you cannot use any other uh, uh, any other applications while you're doing the test they also uh, there are systems which actually track your eyeballs to make sure that you're actually looking at the screen and not here and there looking at books 
uh, or any other reference material. So these technologies will only get better, yeah. right? In fact, um, you know, when I was in college, which is not too long ago, <laughs> um, then also I have taken exams while sitting at home. That's point two. Point three is that the need for assessment and the way assessments are done will also change. Yeah. Uh, the concept of exam is something that's extremely old, extremely archaic, right? That's been with us for thousands of years. Um, so what are the new assessment ways that we can come up with, right? So for example, if you're a student of, um, uh, let's say, uh, political science, which I was, um, there is no point of taking uh, an in-classroom test. There's no memorization that's going to ever help you in uh, doing research on political science. So there we used to have uh, papers that you could just write, um, you know, sitting at home and then submit those. Uh, more often than not, most of our exams were actually open book exams, right? Um, and so when exams themselves become open book, then there is no policing that you have to do to make sure that everyone is, you know, uh, no one is cheating and, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, three things will happen. One is that, uh, you know, of course, we already have a, a very mass uh, online test taking system in place. And number two is that, um, you know, new technologies on your own desktop will ensure that um, a proctored testing can be done effectively. And number three is that the way assessments are done in various disciplines will only change and not require proctoring of examinations. Thanks, Mr. Mittal. Uh, Dr. Shashi, Dr. Dr. keeping the assessment and the delivery of the online uh, into picture, do you think the employability rate for students in, uh, in education 4.0 is going to increase? Yes, definitely. Like, you know, one thing which we should understand is when we say industry involvement in education, we should ensure that students are taught, as I, as I mentioned before, about the process of learning new things in a very fast way. It is not about, like, you know, teaching a student artificial intelligence with the hope that he would get employed soon, immediately upon graduation. Not, like, you know, immediately teaching them robotics and then, like, you know, anticipating that he or she would be getting employed immediately upon graduation. So what our universities and as faculty members, what we need to ensure is we need to give students the ability to unlearn, relearn, and uplearn. So wherein, like, you know, whatever they have learned before, they should be able to forget it because technology moves at a rapid pace. Within the three years or four years in which a student spends in the campus or, you know, or either online mode, what was in the industry would change immediately. Like, you know, it's just changing at a faster pace, faster pace. So students should have the attitude to learn new things and be able to apply them. So as long as we are able to convey and inculcate this skill in the students of learning new things at a rapid pace, and like you know, they would be able to succeed, and that is what I believe industries are looking for. They're not looking for students like you know who are, who are excellent data scientists. They're not looking for students like you know who are excelling in one particular um, domain or one particular knowledge area. They want students who have the attitude to learn new things in a very fast way, and then who are able to implement that and like you know get practice as soon as possible. So that, I believe, is a very important concept of Education 4.0. And do you think the interest of the students in with the advent of 4.0, the interest of students are going to change, as in people specifically looking for health sciences, a liberal arts program, or maybe still moving on for the engineering programs? What's, what's your thought on that? Definitely engineering would have, because like, you know, you also have to consider the practicality of what is happening in our society. Society, you know, in our country, we give a lot of importance to that as well. So traditionally popular programs like, you know, engineering would, I, I think they would still not lose their charm. But uh, there was one interesting point which Dr. Sanchepi had mentioned in his presentation is, in Education 4.0, the degrees would tend to get a bit fuzzy. You know, it does not matter if I'm going to be a computer science engineer, I could end up working for an automobile, automobile firm. The other way around, I could be like, you know, an automobile engineer, I could end up working in an IT company in the domain related to automobile engineering. So there's going to be a lot of interdisciplinary learning, and that is what students should be open for, and institutions should also facilitate the same for interdisciplinary learning for the students. Dr. Sina, what's your thought on this? Are we seeing any change in trends? We don't have Dr. Sina, it seems. Professor Pibi Sharma, what? Well, what you know, I'm a big uh, fan of, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, liberal arts education. So, yeah. 
Yeah. I think that uh, soft skills and liberal arts education is going to be very important. I think the world for a long time now has lamented the fact that we have become too specialized and that uh, people don't have life skills. They don't bring a complete set of foundational skills in terms of critical thinking, in terms of problem solving, in terms of communication, in terms of teamwork, uh, in terms of self-awareness. And I think that people are that gap uh, we have not been able to address in our traditional education system right from school level uh, and continuing into uh, college level. So I think this is an opportunity to address all of those gaps. And I think there's a lot of demand from students as well for these courses, which we don't realize. We equate everything to uh, jobs. The truth is that employers hire engineers or management uh, degree owners holders only because that's what's available, but they will hire anybody who solves problems for them, who does good work for them. So I think as long as we start to shift to that model, uh, there will be opportunities to introduce more new courses. But I'm a big believer that liberal arts courses and courses that emphasize cognitive skills, social skills, and behavior skills, some of the skills that I'm trying to teach on the Harappa platform, uh, is the big opportunity in India. Thanks, Dr. Sina. Uh, Professor Professor Sharma, uh, what would the job opportunities for these students will look like in this? Ultimately, what matters at the end of the day when you go to a university, whether you could end up with a job or whether you could become an entrepreneur or whether you are in a position to lead a quality of life that you promised to yourself. In my opinion, employability, entrepreneurship, enterprising mind creation and on top of that knowledge creation will be the three major parameters on which we'll be judging the success or otherwise of the university system and in the industry 4.0 it would be absolutely essential for us to take on board research driven faculty and put them in direct collaborative systems so that students and teachers and their mentors from the industry work together and develop a whole lot of skills which are required today as well as tomorrow as far as the liberal arts and taking on board courses which are beyond science and engineering per se, the curriculum design has already been talked about by Dr. Sancheti has to be mounted on what we call flexibility as being the main plank on which the curriculum innovation need to be carried out. We need to create a space for value addition as well as interest area courses, even create minor area degrees uh, as trajectories during the uh, our course program and by doing this we should be able to take on board a whole lot of interest areas including liberal art uh, attraction of the students but moving bulk of the population towards liberal art as we have been doing in the past in our country has not really come up to the age of creating the job opportunities for plenty ultimately what we are seeing today that the service sector and manufacturing these are the two major job creators as of today and they will remain so and therefore the attraction for science and technology education stem education for which india holds an advantage must in my opinion remain here in order to create advantage india and advantage education 4.0 mr mithil we have a question for you specifically from the audience uh, that regarding teachers that yeah. you recommended the, uh, the actual practitioners should teach the students like cases of medical sciences but in science and engineering or even liberal arts for that matter you can find that they are not from the same this uh, from the same discipline where they are actually working so there are so they are from varied backgrounds for that matter uh, what what exactly oh, no. is the solution to this no for sure i mean i think uh, there is something to be said about academic uh, led education as well there are certain things that we should leave to career academics and to professors Especially, I feel the skilling courses. For example, I don't think I'll ever call, uh, let's say, uh, a career accountant to come and teach accounting. I think a professor of accounting can teach accounting the best, right? Yeah. But let's say we talk about organizational behavior or we talk about organizational transformation. I'm just talking about business as a discipline right now. There, I think someone who's actually worked in the industry and worked on those transformations and worked on those behavioral changes in the company, they can teach with case studies a lot better, with real life case studies a lot better, right? So uh, I think there's certain things we should definitely leave to uh, academics. Um, you know, in, in engineering, you mentioned, for example, if we talk about, let's say, the fundamentals of physics and the fundamentals of engineering, I think those are best taught uh, by professors. 
and those are best taught also in the lab right so that's one important thing that i think we haven't touched upon which is that many courses especially in engineering and sciences uh, rest upon what you do in a laboratory setup right there are lots of equipment that you might have to use that you might you, you might have to get your hands dirty with uh, so uh, a campus uh, an online education uh, doesn't in fact uh, in its entirety give that exposure to students so we have to be mindful and use technology i'm sure there are technology solutions to uh, to this challenge as well um, but but as a group of technologists we also have to think about how to supplement the lab based education and the experiments that students do in the classroom and in the lab how do we bring those online and how do we make them equally effective um, so that that aspect of uh, education is not diluted at all and taking that i'd love to hear uh, you know at that, taking the cue for competition here professor professor sanjeeti how do you ensure that competitiveness or the healthy competition in this new module for learning how do you ensure that what uh, what do you mean by competitiveness we are already competitive in the sense that uh, we do it in a different way we do it with uh, different kind of expertise uh, we do it with uh, uh, you can say with different intent in, in terms of a course and uh, and therefore we are always competitive already in this case we only need to make sure that we clearly spell out what are the likely outcomes what are the objectives of delivering the course what is the approach being followed i'm very happy that uh, mr mithal raised about the laboratory thing which yeah. was missing and i think virtual laboratories are one which are also going to be the main stay in addition to the teaching learning which will happen through online tools which are there examinations we have talked about classrooms you have talked about uh, government of india drew the the virtual laboratories few years back a decade back i was part of it at nit ke surat kal today it is taking good shape and i'm pretty sure this is also going to be a boon because a lot of equipment can be used laboratory equipment can be used 24 into 7 this can be pretty safe also because it is remotely controlled it is electronically controlled so you cannot drive it crazy by doing some wrong settings also one has to prepare well to do the lab and uh, this thing so there'll be a very very good feature which is going to come so a student will have to be competitive in that particular case and it will cut down the cost also and fortunately even a ordinary government institution a student can get exposed to equipment sitting in any other good institutions of the country or even outside so competitiveness will uh, uh, increase uh, my answer to this is uh, that technology has always done the leveling in long run when it starts it's costly it is only in the hands of few elite people or elite institutions but today we can see the example of the solar which is bringing down the cost of energy to low level it will further bring down the cost of transportation to low level we have also seen the case of mobile that the communication is in hands of everyone i think the same kind of technology adoption here will make the diversity also very vast in terms of anything which we do and then its omnipresence also people sitting in rural background or villages will be able to do what i am doing in sitting in chennai or bombay or anywhere yeah thank you dr shashi is it going to increase the competition is it going to increase the competition dr shashi Sorry about that. Please, could you repeat the question? Yeah. yeah. Is it going to increase the competition? The online uh, education. Is it going to increase the competition? Increase competition among institutions, among among students. Among what students. is among students. Do you see the students, students competition going higher? Among themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. So students have always been competitive. That is something which has been age old. and it is still it is still over there we cannot say that like you know today students are not compete, competing amongst each other so that is something which has always been there definitely will be there but with online education and with education 4.0 what we are essentially providing is a way for adaptive learning so previously like you know when we look at the traditional way of how education is being delivered the interaction or the learning experience that students get is minimal and limited but whereas the education 4.0 and the online and online education mainly students can get to learn and hone their skills what they want 
when they want at their own pace so definitely yes in terms of skilling themselves in terms of upgrading themselves the opportunities for them are more then utilizing that or not is a totally different another question to like you know answer that but the opportunities and the chances for the avenues for such you know for the students are more and if well utilized the competition would surely increase among them which is for the benefit because that is what ultimately we want the industry wants as well and that we want students who are able to solve problems who can be deployed right from day one so this more and more so even now like you know we have industry complaining that we have so many positions available but not enough qualified students so with this um, ability where in students can learn at their own uh, own pace and like you know at their own time if they are able to upgrade themselves definitely yes, i think it's for the benefit of themselves and also for the industry thanks dr shashi on that note on that note dr sinha uh, we we would love to have the last thoughts from you dr sinha yes can you repeat the question please yeah uh, uh, it's i think it's time to time to wrap up can we have your last thoughts please can we just have your last thoughts so the last thoughts i think as we have all said enough i think the this is an exciting opportunity for education in general for the country for our uh, institutions for faculty for students i think that we are we are yet to see the best out of india in terms of education and this might be the opportunity for india to showcase what can really be done with new technology and digital technologies in the world of education and that's what i'm excited by so that would be my last word and i i uh, so i would like to urge all of us on this call to really make an effort to see that as a goal uh, for all of us involved in education to be at the forefront of using technology in education thanks a lot thanks a lot dr sena professor sanjeet your last thoughts please yeah technology is going to be uh, making it exciting times for education this kind of an upsurge or this kind of a uh, excitement has not happened to education sector in last many years so this is going to happen uh, remember that we have not talked about ai at all i have just come across one example from new south wales university in recent times where a young faculty with with an age of one or two years of teaching is doing teaching to a class of 500 students and i must say that i was excited uh, to learn from him that he is able to deliver personalized teaching to all the 500 students because through ai through various tools through various activities he is able to judge everything and therefore teaching is going to be very very different and very very student centric and may be helpful in long run in producing what we want to produce or get out of the education setup thanks professor sanjeet dr shashi your last thoughts please sure uh, i just wanted to like you know sum up with two points basically first thing when we talk about online education i want to clarify that it's actually a blended mode of education and not completely online yes. especially in a certain fields like you know engineering medicine be it the in the health sciences it cannot be 100% online so there has to be a blended mode of education and that is what we need to look towards moving to in the future so number one second thing which i'd like to say as before i wrap up is that like you know when we talk about students we also have a tendency and a tendency as educationists to forget about faculty members they are our backbone who would in turn empower the students to be this uh, like you know people who are successful successful out of education 4.0 so faculty training faculty development is also the need of the hour which we should focus on get them more attuned towards industry and then look on to like you know how we can deliver the same to our students as well so with these with a empowered faculty and available technology definitely i think we can improve the quality of our students which is what the country wants and also the, like you know the industry wants as well thanks dr shashi professor sharma professor sharma can we have your last thoughts please um <clears throat> let me say this with conviction that covid-19 has given a wake up call for higher education in india and we have responded to this call highly responsibly and therefore in the times to come we will have to really come to the terms of the new realities one of the very famous management guru of the world peter decker 
almost 20 years ago when I first time became the vice chancellor in 1999, said that 30 years from now, large universities shall be the relics. And I see a great disruption coming in. Now, remember, we are only 20 years from the prophecy made. We have another 10 years to put together a proper mix of online and formal education so to drive the agenda of employability, job creation, enterprising minds and new knowledge creation. And if this is not done, then be prepared to face the challenge of not having the large universities of the kind which India is so proud of. In fact, the good times are ahead and I'm pretty sure the learning experience of COVID-19 will give a fitting background for reshaping, rebooting higher education in India. And we in Amity are firmly committed to create that bright future as we have made adequate preparation in this regard ahead of time and would be able to transject our business with ease and speed and to create the kind of layers of education that are required for education 4.0 of today and 5.0 of tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Sharma. And over to the uh, youngest leader of our panel, Mr. Mittal. Over to you, sir. Yeah. So I think uh, I want to end with a story. Um, you know, when I was in college, uh, I had a 7 a.m. lecture in the morning. It was a Friday morning 7 a.m. lecture. And obviously, I woke up late. And my my classroom was slightly far away from my hostel. So I ran and I tried to reach on time, but I couldn't reach on time. So I missed the entire lecture. Uh, but you know, when I, when I left my hostel, I told one of my friends to just record the lecture because there was going to be a quiz uh, the next Monday. So my friend actually went ahead and recorded the lecture and he sent it to me on WhatsApp and I got the lecture. And uh, when I started studying for the quiz uh, the next day, uh, I, I realized that I could pause and I could, uh, you know, see it again and again, the lecture. And when the quiz actually happened, I think I must have performed the best that I ever have, you know. And I think uh, I probably must have topped that class at that time. My point is that when I realized that, um, you know, online education is definitely the future. Uh, uh, more than online, the blended version that Shashi explained is, is definitely the future. Um, you know, uh, 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 you know, with the classroom can be online, but the entire experience, the wholesome experience of the university is offline. I think that's where we are headed. Um, and uh, I think I also want to thank everyone. It was, it was very interesting to hear everyone's opinions and experiences. Um, and, and great job, uh, uh, College Dunya as well, because you brought a very diverse group here. Uh, yeah. Probably Professor P.B. Sharma is three times my age. And so uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm also very appreciative of uh, uh, coming here. Uh, I wasn't even born when he was the vice chancellor or the chancellor the first time. Uh, so thank you so much for having us here. My thanks, a lot. thanks a lot, Mr. Mittal. On that note, College Dunia will be planting 100 trees for each panelist with in association with Sankal Karu NGO. And for each tree, 200 migrant workers will be given a food for the day. So this is the initiative that we are we are doing in association in commemoration with all the panelists on that note ladies and gentlemen this lockdown is only a physical lockdown it's not a mental lockdown we have to think we have to fight we have to stay safe the pressing question still remains that covid-19 has still pointed pointed out the gaps that are still need to be need to be addressed that are we future ready is the Indian education system future ready? And that's the question for the next panel, which is scheduled on 11th of April. Thanks to the panel for joining in today. Thanks to the viewers. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you College Dunia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, College Dunia. Thank, thank you, thank you Joji. Thank you, sir. Thank you, fellow panelists, for joining us in this very important dialogue and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.